Thanks, Tiffany, and kia ora and welcome to this special Conservation Week edition of our Link Online webinar series. I'm Christine Harper, Strategic Stakeholder Relationship Manager at Manaki Whenua, and one of the most exciting parts of my role is sharing our research with others and helping to see it picked up and put to good use. Many of us have drawn more deeply on our connection with the natural world around us in lockdown and its role in our well-being is readily recognised at, at a personal level. But how do we make sense of this knowledge, build an evidence base and help recognise the benefits from nature in policy? That's the domain of integrated social science projects. Graydon Diprose will leave this, lead this webinar. He's based in Wellington and his work is largely focused on the urban environment. Angela Brandt will provide insights from July's Garden Bird Survey, which invited people to observe nature in their own little piece of paradise. And Alison Greenaway will help frame this knowledge in our fast-changing social and ecological environment. I'll be back at the end of the presentation to help with questions. We really love hearing your thoughts and questions, so please put them in the chat box as soon as you can. Now I'll hand over to Graydon. Thanks, Christine, and kia ora koutou. Hopefully you can see the slides there. Um, so the latest IPCC report and the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, or IPBES, have highlighted the significant pressure humans are putting on nature. And it's often easy to kind of lose hope given all of the bad biodiversity news. So today we're going to report on three research projects, the New Zealand Garden Bird Survey, responses to a question posed in Te Papa's Te O, The Current, and interviews about how New Zealand is connected with nature during lockdown in 2020. So we'll share quotes um, from the interviews and survey responses, and we're gonna use the IPBS Nature Futures Framework to show how people are expressing their relationship with nature. And we'll also highlight the increasing recognition of, uh, of nature's importance for people's wellbeing. So over the last few years, uh, researchers associated with uh, IPBS, sorry, I'll just get rid of that, um, have developed multi-scale nature people scenarios using the Nature Futures Framework. So the purpose of this work was to reposition nature uh, at the centre of policy and governance by emphasising nature's essential role in wellbeing and sustainability. So the frameworks are heuristic uh, for developing positive scenarios that embrace different uh, values people place on nature. So the framework sought to address the Eurocentrism that is often associated with Western ecology and conservation, and also kind of push beyond the ecosystem services framing that is uh, kind of dominated in recent years. And finally, and importantly, the framework sought to move beyond just documenting the kind of bad biodiversity news by exploring desirable futures for nature and people with multiple pathways to get there. So the framework here, um, the diagram here, shows there's three main ways of expressing human nature relationships. So in the yellow, we've got nature for nature. In the green, we've got nature for society, those kind of well-being, ecosystem services stuff. And then in the blue, we've got nature as culture. So the point isn't that any one of the corners is more important than the others. Um, all three perspectives are important, and some may be prioritised over others at certain times and places. People might also find themselves in intermediate positions where all perspectives kind of coexist. So the authors of the framework uh, ask researchers to try using it. So the three projects that follow are our initial attempts at applying the framework. We've only got time to give a quick summary of the projects, so we won't be going into uh, much detail. Uh, over to you, Angela. Thanks, Graydon. So our first project, the New Zealand Garden Bird Survey, is the longest running national annual survey of biodiversity in New Zealand. And it's engaged a wide range of people since Eric Spur began the project in 2007. It's a very interdisciplinary project in addition to the social science work, uh, some of which we'll be talking about today. There have been many, many people who've contributed to and developed the Garden Bird Survey over the years. Um, it was led for several years by Katrina McLeod, who developed the State of Garden Birds report and analysis techniques, um, and as well as the engagement and learning resources that we'll talk about just a little bit. Um, we have 
work done by our informatics team and wildlife ecology modeling team at Manaki Fenua, as well as external graphic designers and our brand and communications team. And we've had some collaboration with science communication researchers at the University of Otago. So it really is a very much a collaborative work effort between a lot of different people. Next slide, please, Graydon. So the New Zealand Garden Bird Survey is really about bringing together people and biodiversity research. To participate in the Garden Bird Survey, people, um, citizen scientists across New Zealand, observe and count birds for one hour over a set time frame in winter, once a year, in their garden, local school, or park. Uh, many resources have been created to help people participate, and an active Facebook group has emerged through the project. Once bird counts are submitted, statistical analysis is done to create useful long-term biodiversity trends and um, ability to think about what's happening with our birds. Um, this includes collecting information on important covariates and running robust analysis to provide high confidence in the trends that we report each year. The annual State of Garden Birds reports are produced that show five and 10 year trends for 14 common garden bird species. And here I've just shown an example of the Piwaiwaka, the fantail trends um, over 10 years from the State of Garden Birds 2020 report that is available on the Garden Bird Survey website. And really this is about um, thinking about birds as environmental indicators and a key way that we can monitor urban as well as rural biodiversity across Aotearoa, New Zealand. Around 65,000 surveys have been submitted over the lifespan of the Garden Bird Survey. So we had nearly 40,000 data points to go into the current 2021 state of garden birds analysis, which is just getting underway. So thanks to everyone who participated this year and anytime you have, it's been great to have your involvement. The past two surveys have had the highest participation rate, um, nearly 7,000 um, or around 7,000 surveys submitted each year. Uh, and the value of the survey itself and how the analysis of the data are set up is that it can show trends in bird counts from the national to the local scale. So here we've got, uh, we're showing that national trend, but also those trends um, across the regions um, as an example, but also over multiple time spans, those five and 10 year trends. And all of this work is drawing on that entire massive data set. So there's a lot more we can do than if we only had a, just a local scale involvement. So it's a prime example of how citizen science data can be brought full circle to support environmental monitoring and decision-making. But the New Zealand Garden Bird Survey has wider aims than building a strong biodiversity data set and reporting mechanism. So it's been combined with research on public engagement, learning, and connection to nature. Some of that work has been in building up the learning resources, really providing the ability for all New Zealanders to participate, and uh, some of the learnings from that are now being published in the literature. So I've got an example reference up there. But Graydon's going to talk more now about some of the more recent work uh, in bringing this together with the Nature Futures Framework. Thanks, Angela. So as part of the evaluation, we've asked uh, survey participants why they take part. And so we've been playing with the Nature's Futures framework to kind of map out the responses. So for example, uh, some participants articulate a kind of nature for nature value. So they just love birds. Uh, they think birds are beautiful and wonderful and they feel worried about declining bird numbers. Other, uh, some participants also felt that the resourcing that goes into actually running the garden bird survey is a great way to recognize the intrinsic value of birds. Other participants emphasised the kind of nature for society value. So they described the well-being benefits they enjoy from doing the bird survey. So how it's peaceful and relaxing and brings some joy or entertains their whānau. Some participants even told us how they are now incorporating bird watching into their daily life as a kind of mindfulness practice. And finally, some participants emphasised more of the nature as culture value. So they talked about how caring for birds reflects their values and kind of sense of identity and how doing the garden bird survey is a great collective way to express this value and also connects them to a wider community who shares similar values. So the other key finding that we found is that through actually doing the garden bird survey, people develop curiosity about nature and then start doing things for nature. <coughs> Excuse me. 
This includes actions like uh, getting involved in predator control, uh, landscape restoration and planting, and talking to their neighbours about better managing cats. So mapping out the values against the Nature Futures framework has helped us with engagement and comms around the survey. So now we emphasise how participating enables people to express all three perspectives rather than kind of just emphasising one. So the next project I'll talk about is uh, TO, The Current, which is run by Te Papa. And this is a forum for responding to environmental issues either in person at Te Papa's Te Taio Nature Exhibition or online. So this question here was posed in the second half of 2020 through a collaboration between Department of Conservation staff and Te Papa. Participants were invited to answer the question and could also fill in an open text field. So we analysed just over 1,500 meaningful responses to the open text field from young people, so 24 years uh, and under. And we focused on young people because we uh, really wanted to understand how they were expressing their relationship with nature, given the kind of, comp you know, the ecological and social challenges they're facing and are going to inherit. Uh, so we uh, kind of coded the responses against the Nature Futures framework here. And so the numbers you can see, uh, 116, 361, 850. So they're just the number of comments that related to each kind of corner of the framework. Uh, and we had 53 responses that didn't really fit any of the corners. Um, so you can, pretty self-explanatory, I suppose. Um, just a note with the nature as culture, we kind of, so the overwhelming um, number of responses were what we consider to be positive. You know, they talked about how great great this was, um, how people are part of nature and we need to care better for nature. Um, there were a small number of negative comments uh, talked about how they don't care and nature is dumb and gross and that kind of stuff. Um, but for us, these findings uh, suggest that uh, these young people increasingly see themselves and wider society as part of and dependent on nature, um, represented by kind of, you know, 850 responses being coded at that nature as culture uh, uh, corner. So to illustrate the sentiments and the responses, we uh, then turned some of them into kind of poems. So I'm um, just showing one one example here of the nature as culture. So on the left, we have some examples of kind of the positive responses. Um, and, you know, people really emphasise this idea that we need to care more for Papatua Nuku so that future generations will have a cleaner and brighter future. And on the right here, we've got some examples of the negative responses. So, you know, that uh, people not caring, uh, preferring to go to the mall, and arguing that the proposition or this question was not economically realistic. So these participants emphasised how they felt disconnected from and apathetic about nature and reiterated kind of unhelpful binaries that often put, you know, the economy against nature. So there's heaps we could say about these findings, um, but we've just included them here today to show how the Nature Futures Framework can be used to quickly show where people's values are at a certain point in time. So in other words, the um, framework helps us to make visible these diverse nature values. So over to you, Alison. Thanks, Graydon. Kia ora koutou. The Connecting with Nature interviews were conducted between March and May 2020. So that was our first alert levels four and three lockdowns. The project involved inviting people to talk about their experiences of nature and lockdown. From the 113 registrations received, 40 people were selected for interviews over the phone on the basis of region and age group. Our aim was to get a range of people from across the country and socioeconomic backgrounds. The interviews were transcribed and a brief thematic analysis was undertaken using deductive and inductive coding and shared back with the participants as quickly as we could via um, social media. The um, next slide, thanks, Graydon. The interview questions were crafted based on a number of ideas of how people connect with nature and what enables and constrains this. In particular, we used a social practice theory approach and also key concepts from the pathways to nature approach. For example, we asked about, did you have access to all the tools or equipment you needed? Did you have to learn anything new or try new ways of doing things to connect with nature during lockdown? Do you have examples of how connecting with nature during lockdown brought you joy, sadness, a sense of calm, frustration, or even embarrassment? 
are there rules, any rules or expectations that are okay to break in order to connect with nature during lockdown? These questions helped us to hear about changes in people's access to things, tools or money, plus what the challenges or surprises they might have faced were as they adapted how they connected with nature during lockdown. Thanks, Graydon. The following quote, um, which will come up on your screen, is from a woman living on the Kapiti coast. Um, she had an underlying health issue and was quite anxious about um, getting the virus. And I chose this quote because it shares some of the most common observations people made of birds and bush. It also points to the importance of including nature and planning for nature and people's access to nature in urban developments. Plus it shares the wow factor that was often expressed in the interviews. The I never knew elements of discovery people often told me about because they had become more aware of nature in their neighbourhoods and also more aware of how the authorities had been working or in some cases not, to keep some nature nearby to where people live. Overall, most people noted that slowing down renewed their sense of connection with nature. Seeing, hearing and feeling nature more intensely both at home and in their local areas. Connecting with nature generated a sense of calm, brought joy and eased numerous anxieties. Thanks, Graydon. Through the interviews, I heard a range of values perspectives articulated as people spoke about their connections with nature. Here, three quotes are layered on the Nature's Future framework as a way of illustrating this. Again, this framework provided a useful way of organising how we might consider nature and well-being. You can see reference to nature's contribution to the household, the perspective that nature itself might benefit from our responses to COVID-19 as well as an expression of how connection with nature is core to identity and culture. These quotes also show how expressions of nature values interweave across the three elements. This is important to consider when attempting to measure the impacts of our moments in nature or to plan for future moments. Thanks, Graydon. The findings from these three projects reflect other research from Aotearoa and around the world, including the recent report from the Department of Conservation entitled Resilience Through Nature. We note there is increasing use of iNaturalist and more initiatives across sectors valuing nature for both personal and societal well-being. Participants in this final project that I've just spoken about hoped that increased connection and awareness of the benefits of nature will provide, the, the benefits that nature provides to, for both nature, people personally and for society would lead to a stronger environmental commitment in Aotearoa, New Zealand. However, according to the latest report from the Auditor General about New Zealand's preparedness to implement the Sustainable Development Goals, we are not meeting these aspirations. More specific targets and stronger baselines are required. The Nature Futures framework can contribute to the work required to meet both of these gaps for baseline and targets. It supports identification of current relationships with nature, whilst also fostering public debate about what other futures might be possible. Namahi nui. Thank you. Kia ora again and uh, thanks very much to Alison, Angela and Graydon. That was a really great um, summary of some really deep research that is ongoing. We've got uh, a couple of good questions to put to you. First of all, I've got one for Angela. Why do we survey the garden birds in winter? That's probably one of the most popular questions that we get asked and um, there are multiple reasons. Uh, one is that 
uh, it's actually quite common to do surveys of birds in winter across the world, uh, possibly less for the migratory bird aspect in New Zealand as compared to places like North America. But it is a time when many bird species are more likely to be seeking out food resources and gardens, for example, because the resources might be more limited out in the bush. Um, and because it started that way, we're now continuing that so that we um, have a consistent data set year to year. But yes, that is the main reason right there. And another one quickly for you, Angela, do we generate a heat map of the, the surveys so that we can see where most of the data is coming from? That's a good question. Uh, we haven't generated a heat map per se that we include in the State of Garden Birds report. We have reported um, as surveys come in um, in terms of uh, through communications channels about where we've gotten the most surveys coming in, but we have done, um, we did do one participation report uh, a couple of years ago to highlight number of surveys and per capita number of surveys, because unsurprisingly, um, we can get the greatest numbers in Auckland, but we actually have better representation in some of the more sparsely populated regions. Um, so that is something that we can look into doing a little bit more in future. Thank you. Now, I think I, I should put this next question to you, Alison. Um, why did we use the uh, framework compared with the sustainable development conceptual framework, which also includes economic, social, and environmental dimensions? The nature's Nature Futures framework is getting at the complexity of values by which people connect with nature and it helps us to stretch out from the most common representations of value. It also helps us stretch out from the more typical boxing of economic, social and environmental because that boxing has actually limited um, our ability to organise society in such a way that we respond much more effectively and in timely ma manner to the environmental issues that we're dealing with. So the hope is that having a slightly more, um, a, an approach that helps us make more visible the wider range of values and ways of knowing about our relationship with the environment will actually provide us with an ability to respond um, in much more effective ways. Thank you. And it is also just it is also just it's also just one contribution of many and I think it's important to be working with a number of frameworks and seeing how they do com contribute. Thanks, Alison. Um, the Nature Futures framework, is that available for other people to access and use it in their own work? Yes, indeed. And um, we're really keen to have those conversations with people as they are using it. So when after this um, webinar, you will get uh, sent an email with the webinar and a number of links and so um, we'll make sure that you can access uh, the framework um, through those links and um, please also get in touch and um, we're keen to have more conversations with you about how you might use it. Great, so so look out for the email that will follow up um, from from this webinar to, to give you access and do keep in, in touch with us as well. Uh, we're keen to keep these conversations going. Um, Sally has uh, said thank you for the presentation, but she was really concerned about the negativity of, of some of the young people in the Te Papa work. Um, I don't know if we can answer this, but do we have plans for how to address some of those issues raised? And maybe I can put that to you, Graydon. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, I suppose I just want to highlight that those negative responses were a very small number compared to the positive responses. Um, so 
yeah, it wasn't a case of equal numbers. Um, but I suppose the other thing to be aware of is even it's really important to understand those negative responses um, <clears throat> because they're actually telling us something around disconnection or how nature is not being valued culturally. So um, it's kind of as important to understand those as the kind of positive or yeah positive responses. Um, <clears throat> In terms of uh, Manaki Whenua directly addressing some of those concerns, I mean, lots of our work touches across those concerns. Um, I can't really speak for all of the research that's happening across Manaki Whenua, but there's definitely stuff going on that is um, addressing young people specifically. Um, Christine, you might be able to kind of say more about some of the other research that we're doing, I'm not sure. Probably not uh, not here, because partly because we've got another really good question coming, and I'd rather put those questions to you. Um, I think this one comes back to you, Alison. So I'll just ask you to take a listen because there's a couple of um, the, it's a longer question. Um, you mentioned having targets to aim for with regards to measuring up to our. Um, sustainability frameworks and, and our, I guess our desires around um, connection with nature. Um, it, can you give an example of what those targets might look like, i.e. should everyone spend one hour in nature per week or should there be X amount of nature uh, within 10 minutes walking distance of everyone's house? They sound like great um, <laughs> targets to throw into the mix. What I was referring to is that um, the New Zealand government ha does make commitments to targets for the sustainable development goals. So, um, and you know, the government runs a process of setting those, of which we do have some, but not um, for all of the goals. So that's what I was referring to. Um, and, but what you're pointing to there is, is what is the process for setting those targets who gets involved in that, how is it um, shared and developed across organisations. And that's what we're offering here is that we think part, you know, one thing to put into the mix might be use of the Nature of Future framework because it helps to get at that kind of um, complexity of values and whilst doing that point to what some possible futures might be. Um, but also just going back to the point about um, the young people, I think things like the Garden Bird Survey are really important. You know, it's reaching out um, to kids in schools and we also um, worked with a group who um, talked about the way that connecting, you know, through doing the Garden Bird Survey or things like that, help them feel um, a sense of place and um, a sense of safety in some of the places that they were in as well. So I, I do think there are initiatives such as the Garden Bird Survey and the work that it does through schools and the right way that schools are, you know, engaging with lots of um, environmental material and tying it into their curriculum. You know, it is really helping um, develop some of that hope and the sense of possibility for what might be possible are other ways of living um, in Aotearoa. And one last question. Um, was there any breakdown of responses in either survey um, into cultural and ethnic groupings? Uh, so for the Garden Bird Survey, yep, we do collect data on um, culture, uh, cultural identification. Um, I'd have to, I can't, off the top of my head, I can't say for the Te Papa um, work, I'd have to go back and have a look at that. Great. So you've um, you've all given us some more work to do. Um, Katerina from our own team has uh, reminded me that there's several areas of, of work going on at Manaki Whenua where we are starting to create um, good resources, particularly to connect um, children with te taio. And um, so what I'll do is make sure that we include some of those also in our follow-up email. So that's going to be a really rich resource for you to pick up and explore this work more, but also to get some perspective on some of the other work that's happening at Manaki Whenua. Um, thanks very much for attending today. We've really enjoyed your company and look forward to some more conversations with you in due course. We'll say goodbye for now and we'll see you at our next webinar. Bye. <laughs>